Good evening, everybody, and welcome to... Uh, let me just pull my chair in a little bit. Welcome to Songwriting Simplified with just me. <laughs> yeah, Johnny is uh, busy tonight, unfortunately. Uh, they had storm damage through in Chicago, um, and so he's had to go out and clear some fallen trees and that kind of stuff from... Uh, various driveways that kind of stuff so that's what he is doing so it's just me tonight so we're gonna keep it short sweet and focused would be uh, what I'd like to do tonight so I hope everybody is well uh, and has had a good week I'm reading some stuff here about COVID-19 in the chat here where um, looks like some some folks that uh, Mika knows or John Edgar knows has died of COVID-19, which is very, very sad. I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, COVID is pretty nasty. It does not look like it is going to be um, becoming endemic or is officially noted as endemic anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, but it is what it is, and we all have to knuckle down and do our part to make sure that we can, uh, limit the spread of this nasty virus and, uh, all of that. So, uh, I'm not going to get political because this show is not about politics, and this show is not really even about health, although our health is, is important, and the health of you guys is important to me too but um you know i don't want to trigger any debates in the chats uh so because that's not what this show is about this show is about songwriting and it's about composing and it's about arranging and it's about you know all of that kind of stuff um so whilst you know this is something that we all have to bear in mind and this is something that we all have to think about and we all have to think about the frustration that we live with, with, uh, you know, various restrictions and those kind of things. Um, and it's hard. It is very hard. Uh, some countries are going through this worse than others. Um, here in Scotland, we're not doing too bad, actually. Um, that said, um, you know, cases of, uh, of COVID-19 are skyrocketing here, but, um, you know, people going to hospital with it and people dying of it is very, very low here in Scotland. Uh, so we appear to kind of, from that perspective, be doing a little bit better than other parts of the world. But, um, you know, uh, I know people who are virologists and I know people who are doctors and nurses and they work in critical care in hospitals and they are seeing this first hand they are experiencing it daily and the grind of it is very very hard um and really all i want to say on the subject is that we all need to stand together and we all need to serve one another and have a one another mindset um that we need to be thinking about others needs and looking after other people first before ourselves um, and if we do that, I think we'll get through it, and we'll get through it faster than if we don't. Um, and that's really all i got to say on the subject. So, if we could kind of, uh, now that you guys have been talking before the show started about this, if we could kind of end those discussions now, I would appreciate it so that we can get to songwriting questions and make tonight about that rather than anything else and uh it will help you guys because it will help take your minds off of it at least for an hour uh and that's got to be good for you guys and it's certainly good for me so uh let's focus our minds on songwriting and uh let's make that the main thing for tonight's show um, I'm pretty sure that there are live streams out there that cater to medical and health issues. Um, in fact, I know of a few actually, um, where, you know, there are epidemiologists and there are virologists and there are experts in the field who are doing live streams where they are helping people with this kind of stuff and they are sharing their expertise. So those are definitely worth checking out. I have been watching a few of them. So definitely do that 
Uh, but yeah, this is hard. This is probably the hardest thing that we have all ever had to live with. And it's the hardest thing that we've all have ever had to live through. But we will get through it. We will get through it. And COVID-19 will at some point mutate into some very much more benign form. We saw that with the, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic that killed 50 million people. COVID-19 is not quite on that scale. So from that point of view, we're kind of a little bit better off than they were a hundred years ago. Uh, but it's still pretty deadly. All the same. Uh, so anyway, there we go. We will get through it. We will survive if we all hang tough and hang in there and stand with each other and care for each other. We will get through it. All right, let's get to your quest, Johns. Music is good medicine. Thank you, Dr. Lipsham. Thank you, Mika. Yes, I am a doctor, by the way, but we keep that one quiet. I don't like to talk about it very much. Anyways, let's see who we've got here. Billy Morgan, we got John Lake, Alps Media is here as well. Hello, Louis. Good to see you, buddy. Thomas Melkerson over in the Philippines. John Lake is here. Martin Weeks, John Edgar, Kevin from Kevin Guitar Stories is here as well. Marcus over in Brazil. Wow, that was a high note. Uh, I'll try and avoid doing that in future. Ironweed Studios is here as well. Wow, you guys have been chatting it up, man. I mean, Dave is here as well. He says, good morning from the UK. How is everyone? Good morning to you, my friend. Hope you're doing well. Don Oliver is here. Hello to you, my friend. Uh, Lollipop Girl, Jaina, good to see you. And who have I missed? I'm just scrolling down through the chat, just basically scanning over it to see who's here, really. John A... Excuse me. John A.L. Hawk is here. Awesome, good to see you. Bobby Booth is here. One of my most solid and dependable supporters. I really appreciate you, Bobby. You know that, mate. Ah, uh, and I think everybody who is here is here. I don't see anybody other... Oh, here we go. Uh, Ronald Figuris here. Awesome. Okay, I think I caught up with everybody. And I'm going to go up and look for red boxes with my name. So if you don't know how this works, before you ask your question, uh, type... Hang on, I've forgotten. This is still running. There we go. Studio 1 was still running and it was so quiet. I didn't even hear it. Sorry about that. Um, so, yes, uh, if you want to ask me a question regarding songwriting, composing, arranging, and all of that fun stuff, music theory, harmony, all of that fun stuff that I love talking about, then uh, type the at symbol, followed by Johnny, and start typing that, and then it will autofill with Johnny Lipson Studios, and you can just click on that. And then after that, you can type your question and I will be able to see that much better um, so that that way I can pick your questions out from just the general chat because I like it when you guys chat. It's cool because we are building a community of people that care about each other. And certainly from the, the chat that I've just scanned through, I can see just how much and how impressively you guys actually really care about each other. Uh, and you share each other's lives. And you know what? It's glorious. It's wonderful. I love it. I love this little community. Um, and it's, I guess it's kind of a shared community between me and Johnny Guy. And I, you know, it's, it's a nice tight knit little community and you all know each other and you all care for each other and you all look out for each other. And I love that. So please do carry on chatting away. It's fine. Love it. But if you've got a question for me, do that. And then what happens on my end is I see my name highlighted in red. And that helps me to pick out the questions. So please do do that. And I said do-do. That's bad. <laughs> All right. So let's go and see who what we've got here for red boxes. Uh, da -da 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 -da
I'm trying to find questions here. Mm -mm -mm. Ambient Dave. Here we go. Here we go. Now we're getting into it. Ambient Dave says, Studio 5 have been freezing, getting support from personas, but it seems like when I'm using Contact 6, it's really odd. Uh, yeah, I, not an awful lot I can tell you. I'm, I'm not sure which one of us is looking after your ticket. Um... But yeah, keep working with us. Keep working with us in your support ticket, and we will try and get you squared away. Um, because you've not really given me a whole ton of information there to go on. Um, but you said it seems to be that when you're using Contact 6, that's when you start getting the freezing. And maybe it might be something as simple as just uninstall and reinstall Contact and see if that resolves it. It might. Um, I've seen that a few, a fair number of times actually, where somebody says, hey, Studio One is crashing or it is freezing using this particular thing. And we're able to zero in and go, yes, it is definitely this that's causing it. Take that out, open up the song. Does it still freeze without that thing in it? No, it doesn't. Okay, well, we, we, that confirms it. That's, that's that thing. And then just do a fresh install from your user account your native instruments user account, just go do a fresh install of Contact 6 and then open up that song that was freezing and see if it still happens. If it does, then it may be that there is a particular issue specific to Contact 6 uh, with Studio One that maybe needs to be addressed by native instruments. Um, because we, you know, we at Presonus, we don't have access to third party code bases. So, you know, if it is a case of this particular thing is the only thing that is doing it and we we can be absolutely certain that that's the case, then um, that would be an issue for the, the manufacturer of that plugin to take a look at. And, you know, if you get crash reports or spin dumps or things like that, you can send them to native instruments for them to look at and their support guys, their development, development team can go, OK, there's this in this particular part of the code and they can fix that. So uh, or they can, you know, dialogue can start between native instruments and um, the Personas software developers over in Hamburg. That can be sorted out. Uh, so, yeah, keep working with us in your ticket and we'll see what we can do for you. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go see what else there is. Uh, Marcus asked, do you enjoy speeches with motivational stuff um, with a background playing for or hit the crowd positivity? I've, I've seen that kind of stuff. I don't write for that. Um, but I know, I know people that do do that. There's a do-do again. <laughs> uh, Ambient Dave says, sorry, it's James I'm working with. Okay, that's cool. James is awesome. I can absolutely vouch for him. He, um, and especially with things like Valhalla, um, Contact, all of that stuff. He is pretty much, th of all of us, the most expert. So you're going to get somebody who really knows their stuff. For sure. Um, I've been advised by James to uninstall my Valhalla plugins, also antivirus, and done a fresh install of Contact 6. Okay, cool. So all that stuff has been done. Cool. Ronald Figura says, upgraded to Persona Sphere Annual today, went off without a hitch. Yay! Welcome! <laughs> We're glad to have you. Welcome, and uh, you know what? Take advantage of just about everything that there is in Persona Sphere. A lot of people think, hey, it's just a way in which you can buy Studio One. Yeah, it is, but that's not all there is. You not only get Studio One and everything that goes with Studio One, pretty much. There's a couple of things that you don't get. Um, but you also get Notion. If you don't know what Notion is, I can show you a little bit of Notion. You can certainly do that. Um, I don't tend to do stuff uh, in Notion on this channel, but I'm thinking about starting doing some more stuff in Notion for those of you that um, do notation and uh, would like to get to know it a little bit better. Chris Swaffer, the guy who is the product manager for Notion, uh, lives just down the road from me. 
and he's one of my best friends. He's awesome. Uh, and uh, we work together actually pretty darn closely. So um, maybe I will start doing some stuff on Notion. Uh, but yes, and you also get you also get videos and masterclasses and exclusive live streams from my very good friends, Joe Gilder and Gregor Bayerler. Um, they're actually really good friends of mine. It's not just that they are my colleagues. Um, I've known Joe for years. Um, and he's like in my little close circle of really good friends. Um, he's fantastic. He's great fun. Uh, and you'll enjoy his content as well. And Gregor is just, he's just, he's just hilarious. Gregor is one of the funniest guys I know. Um, let's see. Uh, Janus says, a lollipop girl says, could you show us the essential elements to putting together a reggae tune? That's a great question. Uh, and it's a challenging one for me because I'm not a reggae expert. <laughs> but there are some, it depends on the type of reggae. Because like with most styles of music, there's like sub styles that go within them. So, and there's like maybe diff a few different ways to doing it. Like, for example, let's, let's just take jazz for a minute, right? Um, you know, there's, there's actually a, a, a bunch of different styles of jazz. There's uh, Dixieland, there's swing, there's bebop, there's cool, there's uh, hard bop, there's, what else is there? There's fusion, there's, um, there's freeform jazz as well and there's a whole bunch of other sub genres within each one of those five six seven different styles of jazz uh and so it is with um with reggae as well there's a few different ways and types of making that music however there are some defining characteristics that make you think instantly this is reggae um and so i can certainly give you a few of the basic identifying characteristics that will make you go, yep, this is reggae. First one is there is an upbeat accent, um, usually played on a keyboard instrument and also a guitar. Now, if you're a guitar player, there's a right way to do it and there is a wrong way to do it. <laughs> the right way to do it is you do upstrokes. You do not do downstrokes. You, you do upstrokes. Um, although you might do like a little combination, but everything starts with an upstroke. Um, you don't just do downstrokes, you do upstrokes. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the guitar. Um, keyboards, mostly, again, it depends upon the type of reggae you're playing. There are a couple of major ones, one being one drop reggae, the other one being two drop reggae. But uh, one drop reggae tends to feature just like a single um, kind of upbeat accent. So if if the pulse is here, one, two, a three and four and. So there's a lot of space created, but the main thing is this upbeat accent one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and and that goes on the guitar and it goes on a keyboard part. And then the bass, here's the interesting thing with the bass, is the bass rarely, sometimes it does, but most of the time it doesn't, it doesn't play beat one. So you'll get something like this, one, two, three and four and. So, you know, most of the time it's a, the bass player is avoiding the one and like occasionally you'll get a one. 
but for the most part, the bass is avoiding beat one. So what happens with the drums? The drums, again, the kick drum doesn't play on beat one. It's like an occasional thing, like beat one would be for the start of a new section of your song. Um, but for the most part, the drums are not playing on beat one. So let's um, jump over to Studio One, actually, and I can give you um, a little flavor of that. So if I go over to my little reggae tune that you heard um, during the, uh, the intro, and I'm just going to isolate my drums. So let's solo. Let's sew them up one at a time, okay? So we'll start with the hi-hat. So this is where um, the hi-hat is. It's on every eighth note. And then let's bring in the rim tap. And then we'll bring in the kick drum. All right, so you can hear that the, the kick is, um, let's take off the solos and let's play it all back in context. I don't know if you're hearing this. I'm certainly not hearing it. What the heck's going on here? Hang on one second. What's going on here? Oh, it's because I've got the flipping volume down. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Let's start that again. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, I had the volume really low. Sorry about that. Okay, let's go back again. Let's go back again. <laughs> and you'll be like, I could hardly hear that. Yes, <laughs> you could hardly hear that. I'm sorry about that. All right, so let's go back and we'll do that again. So, hi-hats. On every eighth note. And this rim tap is on beat three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All right, so that's where your rim tap is. And then we bring in the kick drum. Okay, now for the most part, what we have there is a simple one and two and three and four and or it could be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's a very, very straight beat. And that's often what you get in reggae. Um, now, this particular type of reggae has the kick drum on one and three in a, in a, in a four, four bar. Um, and then the rim tap is on two and four. So it's a very straight kind of pop version, sanitized pop version of reggae, to be really honest. Um, but, uh, you can have a reggae beat where the kick drum is not on one, it's on three with the rim tap on three. So you get one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And that's probably much more common, uh, in what you'd call classical one drop reggae. And it's called one drop because you get the one drop on the kick drum on beat three. Um, so this isn't particularly classically a reggae beat on its own. It doesn't sound like it, right? It just sounds like a pop beat, right? But let's add in the other elements. Okay, let's bring the guitars. Let's go back to the start. Okay. It's kind of got a reggae flavor, but it's not really classical. Now it feels more like reggae because we've got the Fender Rhodes on those upbeats.
right? And then we've got the piano playing kind of um, a little kind of offbeat figure, keeping it nice and simple. But it's that upbeat, you know. Uh, It's that upbeat thing that makes it kind of feel like reggae. So those are kind of like your bare bones basic ingredients of a reggae kind of groove. So I hope that that helps answer that little question. Uh, let me go back up. Uh, Martin says that he's pretty much given up on contact. Too many problems. Way too much work for the simple things I can do in Studio One, not worth the headaches. Contact is actually really, really good. Um, and you know what? It keeps winning awards. That's the other thing that's really amazing about Contact. Now, I don't have it either. I stopped using it quite some time ago. Um, but it's, it's not because it's poor, and it's not because it's bad software. It's because I just wasn't really using it much. So I kind of thought, well, if I'm not using it, I may as well just get rid of it. So that's kind of been my philosophy. I'm not really using it anymore, so let's just get rid. Um, but that said, there are things like orchestral libraries that that um, and other sample libraries that load into Contact, or they will use Contact um, as, as a player to work in Studio One. Um, so this would be true of a lot of the, um, uh, you know, like the BBC stuff, um, I think that has its own player, but, um, the company that makes the BBC orchestra, um, instrument, uh, also makes a bunch of other libraries like Albion and things like that. And, um, you can load all of their libraries into contact and, uh, um, what they're called. Oh, Spitfire. Spitfire Audio. That's who I'm talking about. Spitfire Audio. Um, some of their libraries load in to Contact 6, the free Contact 6 player. So you can load them out, load them in through that into Studio One. And they work really, really well. And they're really, really high quality stuff at a reasonably, really reasonable price as well. Like um, the BBC... Um, the full BBC package, I think, is about 500 bucks. Um, but you know what? For what you get, it's extremely well priced. Um, I have it downloaded. I have not installed it yet. But uh, that's going to be a task for this weekend because it takes quite a while. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to get that all, all done this week, all done this weekend. Um, and I will probably start doing some videos on it as well. So, and on how you can compose using it in Studio One. So, uh, that should be fun. Peter Brooks says, I'm a cool guy. Wow, that's kind. Thank you. Appreciate it. John Edgar says, in your opinion, what was it about Charlie Watts, the musician, that made him so closely followed by fellow musicians? Two really outstanding characteristics of Charlie Watts. Number one, he was very humble very humble. He was very generous. He was very gracious um, and uh, willing to talk to everybody. Everybody who was a musician was a colleague of his, and that's how he treated you. Even if you were like brand new to music, even if you'd only started playing drums yesterday, he still treated you as if you were in the same league as him, as if you were a professional colleague. Um, he was versatile. Um, he played a variety of different styles of music. Yes, he's most well known for his, what he called his day job, which was playing with uh, the Rolling Stones and contributing to creating all of those incredible records that they made and um, playing their gigs. And uh, he regarded the Rolling Stones as his day job. That's what he did to earn his living. Um, but his real passion was jazz. His real passion was playing the music of Coltrane, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Charlie Parker, and playing big band music. That's what he loved to do. He had his own little groups that he worked with for doing that. And it's in that context that I saw Charlie Watts um, 
the most, actually. I saw him play it at the 100 Club and uh, Ronnie Scott's, the two kind of main surviving jazz clubs in London. Uh, and uh, it was at Ronnie Scott's, actually, that I got the chance to meet the guy, which is how I can vouch for him being humble, because he is. Um, he and I had a great chat. It wasn't just, uh, you know, kind of, oh, you're, you know, you're a fan, you know, kind of, I'm going to talk to you as little as I can. He was actually really generous with his time, and, and we listened, he listened to me, we talked, he taught me, he took the time to impart some of his wisdom about the music business, and about drumming, and about playing with the Rolling Stones, and about music in general. He imparted that into me, into that conversation, and it was fantastic, and he bought me a beer. I mean... Who does that? Who, you know, who does that when they play in one of the biggest bands in the world and says, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll buy you a beer. Not a problem. So he bought me a beer. I bought him a beer. And we had a great chat for about yeah, 40, 45 minutes. It was fantastic. And he was just so down to earth. He just treated me like a normal person. And it was great. And, uh, uh, it was interesting to talk about, you know, technique with him, both, you know, being a drummer myself, um, we, we talked quite a bit about kind of technique and drum heads and sticks and and balance points and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he had a lot to teach me, which was great. But he was also willing to, you know, to ask me questions and say, well, what do you think about this? And he was like, oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. You know, so he was that kind of a guy. Uh, and, you know... Up until, you know, the end of his life, it, it seems to be even at his dying moments, he was like that. Um, so, it's, 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 his loss is a great one. Uh, let's see. I mean, Dave says that he got that impression. Yeah, James is, James is awesome. He's fantastic. Uh, he says, I have yet to create a track with Studio One, but working on ideas. Okay, cool. Awesome, Dave. We're, we're very glad to hear that. Uh, let's see, Ronald says that he's mostly interested in Notion and the show page. Cool, okay, well, we can certainly do some content around that, for sure. And maybe I will do some shows, some live shows about that as well. Um, DDD Entertainment is here, she says, hello everybody, hello to you. Tony Stringer asks, why start a song quiet and then acceler accelerate volume when everyone says it's important to catch the interest in a few seconds? See, sometimes dynamics, well, not sometimes, all the time, dynamics are phenomenally powerful. So let's take a classical piece of music that does exactly what you're talking about. And I'm going to talk about, um, I think it's Ravel who wrote um, the Bolero, which was used um, for... Um, Torville and Dean's gold medal winning um, ice dance in the Olympics uh, way back in the 80s. Um, and it's a beautiful piece of music, but it starts out quiet with not much in the way of orchestration going on. And uh, there are two constants, or at least there is one constant that goes all the way through, and that's the drum beat. Um, the bolero rhythm that goes all the way through the piece but the thing is is that as the piece progresses and develops more and more instruments are added to it and naturally because you are increasing the text the density of the texture um and you're adding instruments, you are automatically adding volume. So you're adding dynamics and you're making it louder as you go. And then by the end, it ends in this glorious, uh, I think it's a seven note suspension chord, which resolves um, with this um, glissando, this whole orchestral glissando down to a single note. And that's where, it's, that's where the piece ends. And it's fantastic. But it takes a while before it gets to this big dissonant moment. But that's the other thing that happens in that piece, is it starts out very diatonic. 
and very, very simple harmonically and gradually grows in complexity. And it's those things that keep the listener engaged. You don't have to start big. Here's the thing with starting big. If you start with a big wall of sound, guess what? You've got nowhere to go. You cannot go any bigger than that. So one way to control your dynamics is to keep it within, you know, a, a, a narrow little envelope, certainly to start with in your song and then have a point in the song where you increase that. And that's when you get big and then you can go back down again and then you can get big again. So you can go moderately loud, moderately loud, moderately loud, big, quiet, big again. Uh, and it's those changes in dynamics and changes in texture that keep the listener engaged. And certainly, like, like I, have, I have said several times, you know, you only have the first few seconds of your piece to grab your listener's attention. And you can do that with dynamics. And Ravel certainly did that with the Bolero because it's quiet. And it, when it's quiet, your ears are automatically a lot more attentive than when it's bam, smack you in the face with a wall of sound. So loud can be good. Loud can state your intention. For example, contrast, um, Ravel's Bolero with um, Holst's first movement of the planet suite, Mars, the bringer of war. I mean, Mars, the bringer of war, that, that whole piece is loud pretty much from start to finish. There are points where the dynamics go down a little bit, but for the most part, it's just a wall of sound, which is perfect for describing Mars, the bringer of war. Mars is aggressive, angry. Whereas the bolero, it's a, it's a dance. It's a, it's a very intimate, romantic dance. And it's passionate as well. And it grows in passion and it grows in demonstrativeness. If there is such a word, there might not be. If so, I've invented it and I shall phone Webster's after this show. Um, but yeah, it grows the dance itself grows in wider and wider gestures and more and more passion. And so the music does that as well. Uh, so there's all of those things. You don't have to smack people in the face with a wall of noise to just get their attention. You can do it with a, with just, you know, an oboe and a snare drum or a flute and a snare drum. And, you know, that just states the melody just with the drum accompaniment and then add something else and then add something else and then add something else. And gradually you build up all the way you build up all the layers until you have everything in. And now everybody is like, OK, we're sitting back a little bit from the speakers. You know, it's like I'll give you one final analogy, but you probably got my point by now, but I'll give you one final analogy. Uh, we'll take a school scenario, unruly class. Kids are, uh, have walked into the classroom and they're waiting for the, for the teacher to come in. So discipline goes right out the window and the kids start kind of chatting loudly. There's banter, there's paper airplanes being thrown from one side of the room to the other. There's paper balls being thrown. Um, and then the teacher walks in and if the teacher has a commanding presence and a commanding authority about their persona with these kids, then the kid's direction is immediately drawn to the entrance of the teacher to the class and everything goes controlled, behavior st stilled, everything goes stilled. Um, and the teacher has their attention completely. Good teachers can do that. Really, really great teachers can walk into a room without raising their voice and stand there, not making a sound, and gradually the class will come to attention. They won't have to raise their voice. The teacher waits. And when you see that happen, you it's like magic, and you know that that teacher is a terrific teacher. 
because they're not phased, they're not flustered, they're not raising their voice or making a loud clapping sound to grab their attention. He or she is not doing that. They're just standing and they're waiting. And the kids gradually simmer down and they all one by one come to the attention of the teacher. So you don't have to make big noise to make attempt to grab attention. You can make no noise or you can make very little noise and be, you know, grab the attention just as powerfully. So I hope that that helps answer that question, Tony. That is a terrific question, though. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to see what else there is. Because uh, the, the whole chat just jumped like a flipping uh, high jumper. Okay, I think I'm here. Uh, Be the Crown says, I have to copyright them one by one. Copyright what? I'm not really sure what you have to copyright. If you're referring to your songs before you publish them, then I would agree that that's a good idea. Lloyd Pop Girl says, perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Just that classic reggae sound. I can't find your super chat. That's because I don't have it anymore. Um, uh, if you go back, maybe... 10 shows, I think I explained why I did it. Um, yeah, I think I made a fairly um, clear an explanation of of why I did that. And Thomas has, has confirmed that. Yep. Uh, Ambient Dave says, I rely on contact for my huge collection libraries. There you go. Um, John AI Hot. Is that AI or AL? I'm not really sure. I think it's AI, isn't it? He says, uh, an overview on Impact would be good. I've never used it, and when I open it, I get confused. Impact is really cool. Impact is a very cool tool, and I can certainly do something about that to help you. Um, let's go and create a new song, and we'll go Instruments, and we'll grab in Impact, and we'll switch over to Studio One. Okay, here we are, Impact. Let me just have a swig of drink. Hold on a second. Okay. Impact, you have um, a bunch of drum pads. It looks like one of those Akai MPK kind of devices, and you can click on these. They're not going to make any sounds because there's nothing loaded up, but you've got all of these banks of 16 pads. So they're all labeled A through H. If you have a, a sample library that is big enough to use all of those, then you've got all of those banks at your disposal. Um, I'm just going to bring in uh, probably my favorite drum kit out of all of this, and that's the Tom Breckline drums. I know Tom. Tom is a cool guy. He's also a terrific drummer. He's played with Chit Career. Um, amongst many other musical giants, including Bobby McFerrin and all sorts of other people. Um, but this is uh, his drum set, actually, or at least one of his drum sets. Uh, and it's only mapped to... There's only 16 pads. There's nothing on any of the other banks. Um, but the cool thing is here is... Um, you've got all of those, but it, it also maps. Uh, let's just keep it on. Yes, it is on. Um, it maps to your controller keyboard as well. Something like that. Uh, it's a perfectly playable drum set, uh, as as you heard right there. But the cool thing is, these controls over here, these controls will con will um, control, funnily enough, uh, any one of these pads that you select. So let's take this snare drum here. You can tune it. So let's say we want this to be a little bit higher.
So I've adjusted the tune of this snare drum. And it will stay that way. And I can change the velocity. I can change the envelope of it. I can change some of the attack and the hold and the decay on it as well. So there's all of those parameters. And then I can decide how it's going to trigger. Um, and it's it's got a bunch of different layers and they're layered by velocity uh, and all of that. Okay, so you've got a whole bunch of these parameters here. Um, and you can change the panning, you can change the amplitude, there's all of that you can you can deal with here. And then there's a filter here, so you can decide if you want some extra drive, some punch. Uh, if you want to um, soft clip, you can turn that on as well. So there's like a whole bunch of different things. And you can do this on every single pad, and then you can store that preset. So you can fully customize this basic drum set and uh, then you can store it and you can call it uh, Tom Brecklin Drums Modified or something like that. Uh, so it's very, very cool. Uh, it's very, very powerful and you can decide which controller is going to, um, it's going to receive input from. So I could make it just so that the Atom SQ controls it or my Yamaha QS. QS300 controls it. Um, I normally have that set to none so that um, basically any device will control it. So, so my Atom SQ is doing that. Or my keyboard. I've got the choice. So I hope that helps. That gives you a little bit of an overview. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 uh, Ambient Dave said, I was so sad. Charlie Watts passed. He was just a decent bloke. No showboating. Very humble. Yes, absolutely. I was very, very sad too. Uh, Don Oliver says, my Sphere account ends in November. Love it. Will Personas let me know when to sign up again? Saw it for 30% off this week. Hope to get that deal in November. Um, the, the sale that was on this weekend was just for this weekend. So uh, there may be another sale. There may not be. I don't know. Um, I don't actually, unfortunately, know very much about what goes on in uh, our sales and marketing departments. Um, but even if I did, not allowed to talk about that. Um, suffice to say, um, just keep your eyes open um, to the Personas website, to your Sphere account. And, uh, you know, when there are sales, you'll know about them uh, and you'll get emails as well. So keep an eye on your inbox, keep an eye on the website, keep an eye on your account. And, you know, when sales and things like that come up again, you can take advantage of them. Um, but yes, you will get a reminder note uh, uh, in your account and you'll also get an email sent to you saying, hey, it, your... Um, your membership is up for renewal. Do you want to continue or do you want to, you know, do you want to renew or do you not want to? Um, because you can cancel at any time. You can go to account plan and you can hit cancel there. Um, that's easy enough to do if you want to drop out. Or if you want to renew, you go to account and plan again and you will be able to um, renew there. Uh, kind of when that... Uh, renewal period comes up uh, in November. So hang in there. Uh, da, 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 hope to get that. Yeah, yeah, you won't be able to get that deal um, because that was just this weekend. Any cool tips for creating Halloween exclusive tracks? I love anything horror wise. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, horror stuff. Um, I'm sure that there are some horror sample packs kicking about. Um, that you might be able to borrow uh, some of the samples from and make use of those. There might be some freaky sound effects, that kind of stuff. Um, what I find is if you can find a really good church organ sample, make use of that because you can make some really scary music using a very slightly detuned, very slightly phased uh, church organ. And you can really totally get into freakiness there and some dissonant chords and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, other than that, that's all I can really think of. 
Louis says, Presumpsis offer will be over by then, but just get in touch with me and I'll have special prices for anyone here or on HST. Absolutely. If you're in the United States, Louis is the man to go to. Absolutely. Um, because he can definitely hook you up with some special prices on Personas gear. Uh, because he is an authorized dealer, reseller, that kind of stuff. He's very, very good at coming up with a good deal for people. Uh, Ronald says, the first cut on Peter Gabriel's Up album. Uh, okay. Okay, cool. Secret Squirrel says... He's saying hello to everybody. Okay, cool. Lost track of time. Sorry to be tardy. Yeah, well, you know, you're going to get a black mark against your name. You know that, don't you? <laughs> um, Let's see. John Edgar says, seriously. Okay, I'm listening. What are the main differences between what you and Johnny Guy are doing as the, quote, new music educators of t today versus what is taught in the university school of music? That's a good question. Um, the difference, the difference really is that we teach, um, we teach what we know and what we have experience of, particularly with something like Studio One. We use Studio One all the time. We use Studio One daily. Um, Johnny is a beta tester and he's been around Studio One since day one. Uh, since actually just before it was actually officially launched. He was on the very first Persona Studio One beta team. So that's how long he's been involved with Studio One. So if anybody knows anything about Studio One, it's Johnny. And so Johnny teaches what he knows in his uh, inimitable style. Nobody can teach quite like he does. Um, that's definitely true. Um, we also have our own curriculums. We decide what videos we're going to put out. We decide, we create the content as we see fit, as we please. You know, there we we're not kind of bound to those kind of things that you would get in a music school or a university. The other thing is, is that what we teach, there is no certification at the end of it. There's no, here's a test. You need to now go and revise for the test, take the test. And then you get your certificate at the end of it to prove that you actually know the stuff that we've been teaching you. Um, there's none of that. This is kind of like learn what you want to learn from us when you want to learn it. So in that respect, it resembles more kind of like an adult education learning center, like a, like a night school, that kind of thing, um, where learning is a little bit less formal. There's no formalized structure. Um, so there's all of that. However, I have a qualification in music education. I'm a qualified university lecturer in music and music technology. Uh, I also have taught in high schools and colleges as well as some universities as well. So um, I've been there. I've done that. I've been in lecture theatres and taught um, very long uh, two-hour lectures on, uh, you know, things like just intonation and uh, various kind of um, forms of tuning and temperament before there was equal temperament. And also different types of equal temperament that, that also do exist that um, are not necessarily universal. Uh, I taught things like that. Uh, and then, of course, there were tests. I devised examination courses. I wrote a degree course in uh, uh, jazz composition, which is still taught in one particular university. Um, I wrote um, a, um, a standard certification course for high schools in Scotland, um, teaching um, music technology. Uh, which is now pretty much standard in a whole bunch of schools. Uh, so I, I did that. I've written courses. I've um, I've had my courses accredited um, by professional educational bodies. Stuff like that. So I've done all of that. And now I'm sitting here in my studio talking to you guys into a camera 
live streaming to YouTube, and I teach pretty much whatever I, I think you guys would find interesting. However, what would really help me is getting some feedback from you guys a little bit more about what you guys like, what you would like me to do videos on, what you would like me to focus on for my live streams, so that I can, you know, kind of teach a little bit more to what you guys want to learn about. So if you guys have a particular inclination to learn about, I don't know, 12th century loot music, we can cover that. I've got books, not on the shelf up there, but I've got books on 13th century um, and 12th century music and music harmony and musicology. So sounds like fairly dry subjects, I know. But, you know, if, if you guys are into that, I will make content on it. And if enough people are up for it, if it's only like three people, sorry, guys. But, you know, if all of you show that you've got some interest in a particular thing, then I'll teach it. Absolutely, I'll make some videos on it. So if you want to learn about compression, if you want to learn about uh, different EQs, different EQ techniques, we can do that. Um, you know, one thing I'm going to say is that anything I teach uh, to do with mixing and mastering, arranging, composing, anything that I teach, I'm going to teach uh, pretty much like Johnny does. He teaches what he knows, what he believes and what he knows works. And so I'm going to do the same thing. So there will be folks here in this chat tonight who will not necessarily agree with approaches that I take on a particular subject, let's say compression, or which compressors to use and when. I will have a particular view because this is the way I have always done it. I learned this way, I was taught this way, I apply those things, and so I teach those things. Uh, and some of you may disagree with those methods. Some of you may disagree with what I do and how I do it. That's okay. We're all going to have differences of opinion. Um, but I'm always going to teach what I think. Um, and you guys are absolutely at liberty to disagree. Totally. Um, but just remember that this is my show. <laughs> but yeah. That would be that would be that on that subject. So yeah, that's the difference between me and Johnny and Berkeley School of Music. Ambient Dave says I tend to do just that for my horror styles. Quiet to to start with building tension and a lot of jump scares. Yeah, that's great. Um, Ravel would, would be very proud of you for doing such things. All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Secret Squirrel says, this is so weird. When I'm using the at here, people's names don't pop up. Uh, yeah, they might not to you, but to the person who's receiving them, they will. Um, that's kind of how that works. Uh, Ziggy's hosting the Personas Meetup right after your show. Okay, that's cool to know. Thank you for that. Uh, each and every person that is part of HST and John Lutcher Studios qualifies for special treatment from Alps Media. There you go. That is official from Louis and Alps Media. Um, Marcos asks, Personas plans to do a protocol about plugins like VST slash AAX2. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, VST plugins have always been 100% compatible with Studio One. The reason being, the original VST spec uh, and the original VST protocol was written by none other than Matthias Yuan, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Persona Software. He's the guy that, that basically invented Studio One, but he also invented the VST protocol. He also um, invented Cubase SX 1, 2, and 3. He also wrote most of the engine for um, Steinberg's Halion as well. Um, but yeah, so VST is already a thing with Studio One. Uh... 
Keith says, lost in your area, sat heading for Roslyn in a minibus, couldn't help noticing how many nice new builds there were, probably past your house, past everyone's that day. <laughs> yeah, Roslyn is, uh, it's, it's not far away, I'll tell you that, it's not far away. If you went past a new build development that said King's Meadow, you may well have gone past our development. I'll tell you that much. Uh, Ambient Dave says, I just recently bought Cinesample's new uh, library, Forbes Pipe Organ. Oh, yes. I have heard lots of good stuff about that. Um, I think they, I think they mic'd. I think they mic'd up some of the oldest uh, pipe organs in the world with about 20 microphones uh, when they created that sample library. And yeah, it is scary because they, they did every single stop on the organ. All of the reed pipes, all of the uh, flute pipes. Um, and I think they even have samples of 64-foot reed pipes, um, which... To be honest, let's let's face it, you're going to feel rather than hear. <laughs> um, but yes, I've been in buildings where the 64 foot um, pipes have been un, um, unstopped and they sound, well, they feel phenomenal. It makes your entire insides dance. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 Dear Creek Audios here. Hello, my friend. Not seen you in a long time. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even know you were you were in here, but that's cool. Uh, going to find some stuff. Top of the final workspace. All right, great. Okay, cool. Marco says, your patience, you don't do weak explanations, treat everybody well and are serious about your task. Yep, that's that's how I was taught as um, when I was when I was uh, learning my craft as an educator. That's how I was taught. One of the dark, darkest thing of audio is called intersample peaking. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's because, you know, you can you can clip your audio and you never see it in the waveform, or you rarely see it in the waveform, and certain uh, triggers in some DAWs won't even detect it, and, uh, but you, you can hear it. You can hear intersample peaking. Um, and so one of the ways you can, one of the ways, there are several, but one of the ways in which you can avoid it is to set the threshold of your limiter on the post of your master fader to minus one dB, not like minus 0.1 or minus 0.2 dB, because that's too close to zero dB. And so, you know, intersample peaks can actually go over zero dB, never be limited, never get touched by your limiter, and they can peak considerably, and you'd never know it, except you would hear the distortion in your in your finished render and you go wow that does not sound good but there was no peaking so why does it sound distorted and that's why into sample peaks so if you have the the ceiling a little bit further away from zero db uh you can certainly stave off that to quite a, a strong degree uh meetup time yes it looks like it's it's already starting so um we will end it there, folks. Um, I know that there was some um, other questions there. If I didn't get to your questions, folks, then please email them to me and I will reply to you with a really detailed answer, I promise. Um, but we're going to end it there because I don't want to overlap too badly with, um, with the Studio One meetup. So... Uh, time to a little focus on pitch, aiming to uh, overlook skills because of common focus on pitch. I'd love to find videos on structuring with specific intent to be organic by using expression, articulation, and timing with very little focus on pitch, aiming to strengthen oft overlooked skills building because of common focus on pitch. You know what, Secret Squirrel? Please email that to me and I'll have a think about how I can go about putting that together. Can certainly do that all right folks we will end it there 
Thanks ever so much for coming, all of you, and I'll see you on Sunday back here for Sunday Night Live. Take care. Bye-bye.